Hey everyone, it's Aaron Schechter from the Wet Shaver Review and 365shaves.com. I got with me on the phone right now, Mr. Matt Pisarsic. I'm sorry, Matt, say your last name for me. Pisarsic? Pisar 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 you got it, Pisarsic. Pisarsic, I knew I would get it. Matt Pisarsic from the new Razor Emporium on the phone with me right now. He is our featured vendor of the month for the month of December. Um, I am ultra excited to have Matt with us for this month. Um, Matt does all of my revamps personally. Um, I'm an avid vintage collector of uh, razors, anything from the old styles all the way up through the slims and the uh, techs, the newer techs. And, and uh, I can vouch firsthand of the quality of the work that the Razor Emporium um, delivers. Uh, another really, really funny story, and then I'm going to get let Matt talk a little bit, uh, actually a lot of it, is um, I went through a little vetting process, is what I'm going to call it, before I chose the Razor Emporium to do my restores and revamps. And um, what really struck me that they were the company that I wanted to deal with was for about a week, I must have called... Uh, Matt's wife Tiffany who was uh, running the office at the time I must have called her every single day for about a week straight asking the most nonsensical questions in the world and every single time she was what she was amazingly gracious kind answered every one of my stupid questions and I said you know what this is the type of customer service that every single industry needs and in the line of work that I come from customer service is paramount you know, it's one of those things where, of course, you have to offer a quality product, but customer service is is a huge portion of what a lot of companies lack. And I got to say, the Razor Emporium, you guys really excel when it comes to customer service, and you obviously excel just equally as well with the quality of the work that you actually do. So on that note, Matt, I'm going to let you tell us a little bit about the Razor Emporium, the new things you got going on, and... uh Get a little bit of an education on uh, razor revamps, restores, and any of the other questions that were asked during the week. That sounds great, Aaron. Thank you for uh, such a grandiose and very, uh, very kind introduction uh, for me and uh, for speaking so highly of my wife, Tiffany. Um, yes, we've been we've been kind of running Razor Emporium, uh, you know, for several years, and uh, Tiffany got involved. Um, back, I think, in 2011, 2012, and uh, she ran all of our customer service and, and phone calls and emails and shipments and running to the post office and all the fun, exciting things that come with that. Um, and she's kind of moving into different directions, she's working full-time for a friend of hers in another area in the business world, and uh, she still helps with a lot of our promotional videos and promotional uh, stuff. In fact, we started a whole new campaign, as you kind of indicated, Aaron, um, with what we're calling kind of the new Razor Emporium. And, yeah, a lot of people know me from, you know, past years with, uh, you know, kind of, you know, cutting my teeth in the industry, uh, getting started collecting, learning how to shave, learning some of the tips and tricks. But then, you know, going from that to being a vendor is a very different you know, transition. And, you know, we made, we made some mistakes along the, along the way. Um, you know, Razor Emporium started off as a hobby and as uh, something I did after hours. You know, I had a day job like like all of you out there. And um, we kind of got to a point where uh, I was running the business with a friend and I kind of, we decided to go our own different directions. And now uh, Tiffany and I, you know, took ownership and we're running it ourselves full time. And this is our, this is our full time gig and uh, my full time gig. And I left my day job and uh, kind of, kind of all in. Uh, since February of 2013 to, to build this company and grow it. And the way that we're starting that is um, what I'm calling this campaign of the new Razor Emporium. And what that means is that we've looked at just absolutely every aspect of our business, what we do, how we do it, and why we do it, and decided that how can we make this just even better. And the first thing was getting it out of the house. You know, we ran the business for several years out of the house, and people have seen pictures of my living room with the collection and stuff like that in it. But um, I've been posting a lot of video, or sorry, a lot of pictures up to Facebook of our new shop. We moved in here in September, 
We have a 1,400 square feet facility. It has an office and a lobby. Which is beautiful. Large work area. It's beautiful, um, by the way. And do everything in house. Yeah, it's just it's just great. That was the kind of big first change because before with Razor Emporium, you know, it occupied my garage for restoration. It occupied my living room, my dining room for shipments, and we saw customers, but it was really you know it's not always the most. Um, gracious hosting, you know, event if you have to come to someone's house. So now that we're here, uh, we have customers dropping in left and right. In fact, I just had a customer literally this afternoon come in for two hours and, you know, walk out with several hundred dollars of, of some vintage straight razors and uh, all sorts of uh, shaving accessories. And that's just part of it. But now we can see customers and now we can do more things in our own workshop and not have to be confined by, you know, my, you know, my day job and my house and trying to arrange all that with customers sure so, yeah you know, we're just taking a whole different look at it and really getting more serious with the business absolutely and you know matt what i really liked and i know you posted it on the wet shaver review is um you know you posted that video you know a really common frequently asked question about you know i just got this razor i bought it off of wherever the case may be let's just say ebay or wherever it may be and it comes to you and it's got some soap scum on it it's got a little bit of maybe rust on it or some kind of uh you know debris on it that you want to clean off and that was that video you made was so wonderful with just a nylon brush a brass brush mineral oil and uh the flitz uh you know uh polish i mean you're able to produce such really really quality videos and um tutorials for your customers now out of the new shop and it just it looked great it looked really great and i also wanted to give a shout out just because i've gotten excellent customer service from your new um uh your new um i guess desk front manager. desk manager yes marissa she has been nothing but amazing as well so everything Thank you guys got going on there right now is amazing yeah. The video that you guys saw that I posted up there, we posted to our YouTube. That is the that's part of you know the new razor point is you know before I was I was shooting videos about collectible razors and the, you know they're all very relevant and great but they're amateur. You know, I was holding a camera and talking at my kitchen counter, you know, pulling a few pieces out of the collection and talking about them and you know now we're we got involved you know because of Marissa, um, she has a background in video production and she's actually shooting a western movie right now in her in her spare time and she's not at work and so she brings that kind of experience that kind of uh quality to what we're doing it's just a great it's just a great connection so you're going to see we, we have a goal um of a one video per week we've actually already shot several and we'll be releasing them in weekly increments that are along this line of transitioning from you know the past with the, just the collectibles only to now more of the tutorials more of the lessons more of the techniques more of the how-tos and i'm really thankful for the for the all the you know viewers and readers of let's share a review because i asked you guys you know a few days ago hey would you guys be interested in a series like this and you guys responded so you know favorably and so warm and so reassuring that yes there is room still in the market for more education, and so now we're going to provide that. Yeah. So that's just more, more things that we're doing to try to help our customers, help people out there, help the average guy who doesn't know anything about wet shaving, doesn't know a safety razor from a straight razor, but wants to get started. And we like to show people how you do some of these things, how to not mess up a razor, how to take care of it. So I'm glad you guys like that. Yeah, and the other thing before we get right into the questions, um, right, I, you know, because I don't want to take up too much of your time, and um, I'm sure everyone is really, really interested to see about this week's raffle. But um, that's another thing I wanted to point out about uh, you, Matt, and your business in the Razor Emporium, is you're making these videos to help the average wet shaver that might either be um, just getting into it or someone that has even been into it since, you know, they might have grown up doing it since they were 15 years old and started shaving, is you are spreading that knowledge to them where a lot of companies would just say, you know what, you got a razor that's kind of scummy. Yeah, give me 20 bucks, send it over, and I'll clean it for you and send it back to you, and this is what it's going to cost. You're actually saying, listen, well, we'd love to do the work for you, but 
here, buddy. You could do it on your own, and this is how you do it. So it just goes to show you're the type of business that you're more about the customer service, more about the end result, and not about just the quick sale. It's about Thank it. You. Yeah, that's that. I I got a lot of inspiration from Gillette. You know, I'm a collector. I hate to see you know these these really cool collectible razors have any kind of harm befall them. And truth be told, as I kind of addressed in the video, I'd rather just clean a razor than have to, you know, strip it and replate it and all this stuff. I'd rather someone, you know, approach it and, and try to clean it carefully and safely than have to, you know, do damage to it. And, and you know, also along the lines of Gillette, a lot of you guys know, Gillette started a whole campaign of shave yourself. And, you know, they moved away from barber shops and straight razors and the whole idea that the average man couldn't do something, that there was some kind of glass ceiling to his ability. And I think part of the whole wet shaver community is saying, no, I can do it myself. I can teach myself a new skill. I can make my own ladder. I can, you know, you know, learn to strap my own straight razor. I can learn how to master a safety razor, you know, whatever. Part of our community is that it's empowering, you know, each other and, and then spreading the word, spreading the education. That's what I want to do with this video series is empower people and spread the knowledge that's taken me, you know, seven or eight years to learn and master and read about other places and collaborate, but then spread it in quick, you know, two, three, four minute videos to people that, you know, condenses all that information down and delivers it right to you professionally. That's awesome. That's absolutely awesome, Matt. And let me tell you, um, the new razor, new razor Emporium. You guys are definitely going in a great direction. Um, I've been dealing with you guys for a while now, and uh, let me tell you, from day one all the way up to right now, while we're on the phone, it's been nothing but an amazing experience. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that I got you on the phone right now, and that we're able to do something like this together. So, um, that being said, let's get into some questions because um, I think we pretty much established what you're all about and what the Razor Emporium, the new Razor Emporium is all about. So um, let's let's dig a little bit deeper into some of these questions that the guys asked on the Wet Shaver Review. Sure, yep, I got it pulled up right here. I did, I did try my best to answer uh, some of these questions. Some of my responses were a little more brief and I can kind of get into more detail here. Um, I think a couple of things on here that, you know, one, one question that uh, Kurt Arnie Soli, I hope I'm saying that correctly, asked, he said, if I send a rhodium aristocrat that does not open and close, what could be wrong with it and can you fix it even if the threads on the TTO knob are worn? That's a question I get actually a lot and maybe, maybe it'll even be a quick little video response we can do. Um, you know, if you have any kind of issues with um, any kind of threading on a vintage razor where the threads are worn or stripped, and, you know, I, it's kind of like a haircut. I can never I can never put metal back on. I can always just take metal off. So if, if something's stripped out and the threading's damaged, it's really sad, but it's probably not something that can be fixed. So uh, to answer your question, Kurt, you know, it's it's maybe a nice collector's piece now. It's going to put on the mantle, but it's not something you probably could hold a blade securely. Yeah. Um, other these questions well uh, really quick though really quick though matt the only other thing i could think of for kurt and his specific situation if it's a if it's something that's like a common razor for let's just say for example um let's just say it's a a a 1960s uh fat boy for example okay uh classic tto obviously it's an adjustable let's say he had two of them one of which was you know kind of like really in bad shape but you know, it had a great TTO, you know, gear mechanism that was still operational. If he was to send you both of those razors and say, hey, you know what, I got one that you could take the spare parts from and then put it into the one that had the stripped internal TTO mechanism, is that something where you could, like, for lack of better term, steal from Peter to give to Paul in order to make the better one working condition and look at, make, make it look nicer and actually make yeah. it work by using spare parts? You know, the short answer is yes, and we've done that several times for people, and we've, I've even done that amongst my own uh, razor, you know, that I, you know, razor pieces that I sell to you guys out there. Uh, there are times where, you know, we, we do have donor razors, as we call them, but I always do remind people of that. Um, you know, razor parts, you know, I never, I never got some big shipment from Gillette of a bunch of random parts, 
and, and instruction manuals of how to do things. I've I've had to learn or just had to been broken ones that you know give up their pieces. And uh, we actually just had a had a lady of all people. It was, it was not a guy. It was kind of a lady. Miss Elizabeth was her first name. She sent in a Gillette executive, which was very similar to the Fat Boy, and it was missing uh, the little aluminum red clicker that makes it click as you change from, you know, three to four to five and up and up and up the adjuster. Yep. And so it's missing that clicker and it's all disassembled. And she said, well, you know, so I'm sure you just have a clicker sitting around. And I said, man, you know, this is a 1960 you know, executive. I don't just have a piece for that. So if you find another one, send it in and I can, you know, take it off from, you know, one to give the other. But I don't just have pieces laying around. Sure. A lot of these are specialized, and you can't just easily fabricate them. So the short answer is yes. If you send me two razors and one's good and one's not, I, I swap parts okay. all the time. I can do that. But uh, we don't just have – we have some pieces, but, you know, not all the time. Uh, of <laughs> course not. Specialized pieces. Of course not. And, of course, Gillette's not going to – like you said, they're not going to send you the uh, instruction manual for 1961 uh, Fat Boy and say, hey, here you go, Matt. This is how we built it. They're not going to give you those trade secrets. You have to uh, learn that. It's all been trial and error. Yeah, and, and, school know, of I, hard I knocks. Years ago, and I, I will admit I broke many things early on, you know, 2007, 2006, you know, when I was getting started. I, I ruined a lot of, I, I ruined my, my very first toggles. I ruined trying to oh, take apart and figure out how it worked. And That had to have hurt. Things. That had to have hurt to hurt hurt to uh, to damage a toggle would make me cr- literally I'd probably cry if that happened uh, to I, me. I did too, and that's, that's, <laughs> that's kind of one of those scenes. That, that, you know, one of the angles that I always tell people when they work with Razor Emporium versus, let's say, a plating facility to do your work. And, you know, someone who's you know maybe also polishing uh, bumpers or headlights. When you know when we work on stuff, we work on razors exclusively, and you know me as the collector and you know, the guys who work in my shop with me. We've, we've been working on these things, and I've taught them things that uh, that are so specific, and they're, they're, they're razors, and we're never also mixing into the batch, you know, screwdrivers and, and bumpers and, and you, know, you know, all these other pieces. So we're, we're very specialized in working on razors and working around them and how to, how to not break them, and that's one of the, the benefits that um, I've always said to people, that you can trust me because I am a collector, and I want to make sure that piece does not get damaged. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. So Kurt, hopefully that helped you out a little bit. If you got it, I don't know. I don't remember exactly which razor it is you have, Kurt, but if you have another spare one that you're willing to kind of like sacrifice, maybe Matt might be able to help you out. But like you said, you, if you cut your hair, the, unless you're using crazy glue, you're not getting that hair back on. It just, it doesn't work the other way. It only goes one way. So, uh, moving forward, what else do we got as far as some questions we can get a little bit deeper into? Sure. So this is a question that has to do more with modern razors. We've talked so much about vintage. Um, this is from Paul. I think it's Thurber. Thurber, yep. Uh, Paul asks a really great question. What are the advantages, if any, of stainless steel razors like Icon or Trader Ray? That was a good uh, question. That was I, I actually like that question, too, because I just bought that Icon recently. Yep. That was a great uh, question. Not to brag, you know, guys, but uh, I, I do like to, you know, give credit where credit's due. I've always been an early adopter of, of stainless steel. Uh, we were the first vendor in the United States to bring Icon and Pills razors to the collector, I'm sorry, the, the wet shading community. So we were the first, you know, guys to bring those in. So I, I've always loved stainless steel razors. And uh, I don't want to spill the beans, but I, I have some aspirations of making uh, a razor down the road sometime in 2014. And stainless steel is a very appeal, appealable, you know, choice of material. Um, I would tell you, what are the advantages? Well, stainless steel is obviously what it sounds like. It's stainless. It's going to be much more resistant to corrosion or any kind of plating damage that can happen on razors like Mercur or Edwin Jagger or Mula that are made of zinc and plated in chrome. You know, so if you have a razor that's solid stainless, there's no plating to worry about and it's never really going to corrode. And if you do need to do any work to it, you're working with a solid metal. It could always be milled or sanded down or even plated. I have plated razors for icon in fact we have a 24 karat gold slant icon that's going to be you know be ready here in just a few days so we've even done plating on the stainless steel but regardless what are the big advantages well i always tell people you need to remember that just because it says stainless 
does not mean it's, you know, stain proof. It's more of stain resistance. And only a few of the makers are really using true stainless metal. And you want to look for 316L marine grade stainless steel. That's going to be stuff that's going to resist all sorts of moisture. It'll never take on water, should never really rust. However, a lot of guys with the stainless steel razors first started hitting the market. A lot of our customers were saying, hey, I just bought this Pills razor. Why am I getting some staining on the inside? And the thing to remember is that just because you bought a stainless steel razor doesn't mean that that cheap double-edged blade that's going inside isn't gonna do some staining itself. And that's what can happen. Uh, we like to call it tea stains almost like how a tea bag yep. stain the bottom of your porcelain, um, you know, mug. So the way to avoid that when you have a stainless steel razor is to take the blade out or crack it open to let it air dry. And you notice the old Gillette razors had the blade tabs sticking out the side. And a lot of the razor companies today are trying to hide those. Like Icon, <laughs> like the new Icons yeah. that you, that, right. that they're completely encased. Yep. That's right. And so, Especially if you have one of these modern razors that have the enclosed blade, please take it out. When you're done shaving, put it somewhere safe, out of reach of the kids. Let it air dry because those those cheap blades will put a little bit of stain onto your really nice premium razor handle, and you'll be sitting there frustrated when really it's the blade. So these are two really important things to keep in mind. Also, a lot of people ask me about the feather. The feather razor from Japan. Yeah, the a, what's that? The ASD one and the ASD two feather, if I'm exactly. not mistaken. Those are stainless steel, but they've done some interesting things with coatings, and you're starting to see this now. Really popular Weber. Weber does a uh, stainless steel razor with, I think, a DLC, like a diamond coating. Correct. Yep. And and feather, they don't really publish this a lot, but that feather razor has like a nickel and Teflon mixture coating on top of the stainless to try to prevent these little stain marks from actually getting onto the handle. So I'm just letting the, the whole community know stainless is great. Stainless is a really great metal, uh, but it doesn't mean that the blades won't leave little marks. Take those out and let those you know, air dry and just make sure you put it away dry. Now, let me ask you an actual personal question, you know, just because you're bringing up uh, blade storage. And, you know, I didn't see anyone ask it, but, you know, I've been wet shaving for quite some time now, and I, from day one, have always, when I, my kind of routine has always been, you know, you go through your shave. Um, usually after a shave, um, I use an Allen block, almost always. There's, I can't think of the last time I had never, you know, haven't used an Allen block. And usually what I do is when I put the alum on, I usually start my cleanup process. You know, I clean my, you know, my brush out. Um, hang it up, you know, kind of like, you know, shake it out to dry, dry it on a towel, uh, put it back in its holder. Um, then I'll start cleaning the razor. I'll take the razor apart. I'll rinse any residual lather that's left in the razor. I'll rinse the blade off, though I do not wipe the blade because I don't want to dull the blade's edge. But I usually actually always keep the blade out of the razor until everything is fully dried. That's good. Is that is that that's a recommendable really, really practice? Is that a recommendable I mean, practice? That'd be a great way to do it. You can pat it dry, like you said. Don't wipe it. You can pat it dry, pat dry the, the top cap. You can pat dry the guard and the handle. And then yeah, once you know you're cleaned up, your brushes away, your soaps away. Yeah, sure. You know that'd be a great opportunity to put your razor set back together. That'd be fine. But a lot of people are in a rush, maybe or. They get distracted. They're cleaning the brush out. They end up leaving their razor handle sitting there with the with blade, the blade in it. Yeah. So if you if you dry it first and put it back together, that's, that's, that sounds great. But yeah, just just don't let it sit there with all that water and moisture on it. Gotcha. And and just so I don't sound the fool, of course I rinse the alum off after I'm done cleaning up everything else. The alum does get rinsed off my face, uh, just because I don't want anyone leaving alum on their face and then getting a, an alum burn. Uh, thinking I'm, you know, supporting leaving alum on your face without rinsing it off after a couple of moments, you know, a, a minute or three, you know, type of a thing. So always rinse your alum off, guys. Don't leave it on there for too long. It could actually irritate your skin instead of uh, benefit by the uh, astringent properties of alum on its own. Um, so, okay. So I think that really answered that marine grade stainless question 
pretty darn good. I think that, you know, that's really industry standard guys that, you know, when you're looking for something like a stainless steel razor, which I own, uh, you know, the Icon uh, razor, um, the open comb uh, Icon razor. Let me tell you, it's an amazing razor. And another thing I really like about it is the weight of it is the weight of the stainless steel and the balance of it. Um, I, I just find it to be a really, really, really great razor. Greg uh, Khan from Icon Razors, really, he did a wonderful job on that razor. Um, I'm not familiar with the feather, but I can tell you I really like the Icons. Um, so anyway, moving forward and onwards, um, what else popped out at you for questions? Um, another person asked about um, string razors. We've been talking so much about safety razors and I know that by and large, a lot of us do use safeties over straights, but I don't want to um, not address some of these questions. W was There's that really Jeff Conrad? That I get a lot of times about straight razors, and you know they kind of kind of asked more or less. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to find the exact question here, but I, I remember it, the question was basically what constitutes a keeper. I think it's Rob. Yeah, here it is. Robert oh, Rob Lathrop. Yeah. Um, he asks, uh, you know, what constitutes a keeper razor? Like if you're in a shop and you stumble upon one. And that's an awesome uh, question there. I actually even posted a little a link to another friend of mine in the, in the community, Art of Manliness, run by Brett McKay. Yeah. It's a great website. Um, and we did, we did a series of, uh, of some work over there with you know addressing a lot of these common questions. And I'll probably actually turn it into a, a video of how to buy and restore a vintage tree razor. And that's one of the biggest things. So you're out, you're out at the antique store, you know, maybe you're at, you know, grandpa's house, or whatever. You, you come across a vintage trade razor, and it's a little foreign. You know, we're used to seeing Gillettes and stuff, and but all of a sudden this this cut girl comes across, and you're like, whoa, what do I got here? Well, the biggest thing you always want to look at, besides who made it, what kind of handles, how big, those are all great, you know, great things to think about. But really, when it comes down to it, it's the cutting edge. This is a tool. Just like anything else, like a kitchen knife, like an axe, if you don't have a good edge, it doesn't really matter who made it. And the first thing to look for is always going to be apparent, which is chips. If you see a chip in the blade, I tell people, if you lose more than, you know, an eighth of an inch or so, that means that someone like me, you know, someone like the guys who work here, we have to take that blade and do so much sanding to get that edge uh, all consistently flat again that it really changes the geometry of the, of the razor so much because we take all this blade off without taking the spine off. Because remember, a straight razor kind of has a fixed proportion between how wide it is and, and what that dimension of that spine, the, the top of it, the back of it is. And if you take all this dimensional you know, steel off of the cutting edge to make it flat because there's a chip in it, and now you're your spine is still the same thickness, it's just never going to lay on the sharpening stone the same way ever again. And really, so I say about, about the size of a grain of rice, or maybe an eighth of an inch or so, that's about all you can really take and before really altering that geometry. Um, the other big thing to look at, and it's much harder to see, is little micro fractures, especially ones that are going vertical. Uh, you know, if there, there is... There is hundreds and hundreds of cutlery companies through the 1800s and 1900s making straight razors. And, you know, they're all made by hand. they are different qualities of steel, different forging processes. Sometimes the steel did not hold up that well. Sometimes it reacted to temperature or humidity or whatever. Age, maybe it's dropped. Um, if you see a, a fracture just even starting, it's going vertical, that's, that's basically now a paperweight or a letter opener. Gotcha. It's just never ever should be shaved with because that you know it's not it's not a true blade anymore you literally have the, two razors yeah there. the integrity it is just completely gone it could cause a cut it could scratch you it's not a good thing yeah the integrity just isn't there anymore to the to the actual blade itself it's just not there at that point yeah so i mean before we even you know i really want to get launched into what brands to look for and you know that's a whole other conversation we can definitely have that but short answer always look at the blade integrity Always make sure you're not going to have a chip in it and it's not going to be any kind of, uh, you know, fracture. Another big telltale sign that a razor, straight razor is, is, is kind of garbage or its life is, is over is any kind of weird burn marks or any kind of discoloration to the metal. A lot of people, 
have may have tried to restore an edge and they'll have brought it to a grinder in their garage or a buffing wheel and they don't know what they're doing and they heat up the, the metal way too hot. They, they harden it. And, and, and yeah, they ruin the tempering and now it usually leaves behind a telltale sign and that is sometimes like a bluing or like a purplish weird blue color or discoloration or burn mark yeah. on, the, on the metal. Exactly. Something that someone tampered with, it's again not going to hold an edge, it's not going to feel comfortable, it's going to feel brittle, and it's going to feel very uncomfortable to shave with. Again, that's a nice piece, even if it's grandpa's. Put it on the shelf, enjoy looking at it. Exactly. And try to shave with it. Exactly. As 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 a metal worker myself, I was actually well, I kind of moved up the ranks, but I started out as a, a union metal worker, and uh, that's one of the first things that we always learned was when you're dealing with metals, especially steel and uh, stainless steel specifically, is um, you know you you never really want to like bore down full weight on it or over grind it or anything because you're actually hardening the steel and exactly. what happens is, is then you make it more brittle and what will happen is you make it actually unworkable at, at, at when you get to a certain level it, it's completely unworkable it becomes brittle it's almost like um, dropping a, a frozen you know piece of ice on the ground it could almost just shatter it becomes so brittle exactly. that, that's a really good analogy and you're absolutely right when, when, when we work on straight razors we're just as first working on straight razors as we are working on safety razors we use different machines they run at slower speeds we use different kind of compounds and you probably use oil probably you have to use oil to keep it from generating too much heat at that point too exactly exactly we always are cooling it down making sure that edge doesn't get too yep. hot and i mean it won't be too hot for the for you to touch but it really shouldn't be that much hotter i mean it's probably i don't know i don't i'm gonna tell you but maybe 100 you know 30, 140, 150 degrees, somewhere probably there. I mean, it's just after the t point where you can touch it, but it, it never gets it never gets blue hot or anything like that. And so we're really careful when we're doing that, uh, making sure we don't affect the, uh, the tempering. Gotcha. Perfect. You know, that that's always a, a great question. You know, even myself as a, as a collector of vintage razors, and I have... Um, you know, I'll be honest, I don't have that many straights. I'm just, you know, I'm just really honestly not that good with a straight razor. I keep on telling myself I'm going to practice and get better at it. But I, I do have well over 100 vintage, um, either uh, single edge or double edge um, vintage razors. And, um, you know, another thing as far as a keeper, and I know it's a little bit off topic, but, you know, what makes something a keeper? It's not always, like you said, it's not always does it look great does it shave great sometimes there's a sentimental value that's attached to something that would override the actual functionality of the razor you know sometimes well, that's a that's a great point Aaron. and I, I just had to interject and share this because i know i've worked on some of your family pieces yes and that's one of the coolest that's one of the coolest parts about doing this job is we get all the time we get heirlooms into us um i'm i'm blessed to have both my great grandfather's and my grandfather's uh, shaving setup that uh, was kind of handed down, so it's almost like I came from a line of shavers. That's awesome. <laughs> but, you got you got um, a heritage. <laughs> truth be told, about two weeks ago, we had uh, that came to us. We had a great grandfather, a f grandfather, and a father's straight razor. So three different straight razors. But this gentleman, so this gentleman was the son. And he was sending in literally three generations of straight razors to us. And you hit the nail on the head there. And two of them, we were able to restore and sharpen and polish and they looked beautiful. One of them, we simply did a cosmetic cleaning of the handles and a very light cosmetic cleaning of the metal because it just was just too far gone to really do anything salvageable in terms of shaving. But I knew that it was a collectible and a family heirloom. And so we, we definitely cleaned it up and gave it a quick little tune-up just to look presentable and he knows it's not shavable just put it on the shelf or the mantle or the display case and enjoy but it was just so neat to have three generations under our roof uh, of, of the same line of, of razors I, I couldn't agree with you more and you know the funny thing Matt and uh, I'm not going to diverge uh, too much farther and then we'll get to the next question is uh, today ironically and, and you worked on this razor for me Matt uh, you actually restored it and I have you to thank for looking as beautiful and working as wonderful as it does 
um, the 1936 uh, Aristocrat Deluxe, the special edition with the gold uh, box with the Greek key that was a limited edition in 1936 that was only offered during the holiday season of 1936. Um, my, I was actually raised by my grandmother who passed away uh, nine years ago. And um, I was extremely close to my grandmother. And today, actually, December 6th is her birthday. Um, she was born in 1936, and, you know, it was her birth year razor. And uh, I was able to shave with that razor today. And let me tell you, it, it was amazingly wonderful, the work that you did. Um, it was a very, um, you know, there's a lot of sentiment that goes, you know, a lot of guys shave just because it's you're shaving. It's a functionality thing. Some guys, like myself, there's also a little bit of sentiment behind the actual art and you know hobby and and you know lifestyle of a wet shaver you know there's a little bit sometimes more to it and today i actually got to enjoy a shave using my grandmother's birth year razor on her birthday so you know to, so awesome. what I, constitutes I, a I keeper that's, that's you know exactly what this is all about that's you what know, constitutes it you pick up this double edge or straight razor hobby to maybe start off you know, learning how to shave better. Some people even <laughs> convince themselves that they're going to save money. Uh, yeah, that's really that's what we all told ourselves. <laughs> it's such a great connection to the past. It's such a great connection to our family. And when we do have those family heirloom pieces, it's just so nice to, you know, use them. And it, I, I, I had, you know, I had a customer in here, like I said, just about an hour ago. And he bought several straight razors. And he bought one of the oldest straight razors I've ever come across. Literally, I could say without a doubt, it was, it was, it was probably from the 1820s. Wow. Big, huge meat chopper of a, of a uh, Sheffield wedge. And I said to him, I said, you know what? What other tool, what other object could we pick up that literally could be used the same way 200 years later? The what else? What else could you touch in your daily life that literally could be that old? And it's still functional and still perfectly capable of giving, you know, a utility value out of it. Exactly. You know, there's so much history. And when you buy a vintage, you know, every time I buy, I buy, at least me personally, buy a vintage razor, I wonder about, you know, what has this seen? Like some of these older razors like that I own from like 1910, 1908. You know, they saw World War One. They saw World War Two. They saw Vietnam. They saw you know, Afghanistan, Desert Storm, every, I mean, they've lived through all of this, these razors. So, you know, what constitutes a keeper to me, and I always wonder, you know, where was this razor? What did the previous owner do? So there's a lot of, you know, there, other besides, you know, the functionality, you know, to answer Rob's uh, question is, you know, it's not only the functionality, but what kind of sentimental value or what kind of, um, you know, other value does it hold to you? Because for every single person, what constitutes a keeper is different, you know? So in, in my personal opinion, I think it's a little bit of a personal um, question to the, to the each individual person, what constitutes a razor being a keeper. Now, what makes it a um, more, uh, how can I put it, expensive, collectible, unique, functional? Now, that's a whole nother story. But what makes it a keeper is, I think, really a, a personal matter of um, of uh, opinion. You know what I mean? Oh, yep, I, I agree. So, okay, so uh, on, go onwards. Yep. That was a great, um, great segment there with keepers because you're right, it's, it's so personal. Um, we had a question from Ken. Uh, Ken asked about... Uh, cracks in the old Gillette handle, like we're talking the ball end, old type that was, you know, very the common, 1910s, 1920s. Very uh, common. Often seen in something popular like the khaki set. Um, very long running handle from Gillette, ran 10, 12 years. Those razor handles are just so synonymous with cracking. They also had uh, a very similar type handle in the 30s with the Goodwill razor. Um, they were a very cheap, uh, probably low quality brass. I'm sure that World War One was demanding high quality metal, and I'm sure uh, these guys were using something substandard based off of you know what was happening in the world at the time. But these handles were having cracks even back in the day. We've come across uh, records of that that they uh, had a, either some kind of a, a special denotion on the serial number. 
they've been back to the factory. Oftentimes you see a, a G, the letter G is, is maybe with a circle or a square around it that denotes that it's been back to the factory. But we know for a fact that these handles were cracking even back then. And so a lot of these cracks, these, you know, you guys are maybe coming across with razor sets are not new. And the sad question is, you know, can they be fixed? And, the, and the, it really is just, it's just no. And we've tried, we've tried soldering them. We've tried filling them with silver before plating, uh, stuff, you know, after plating. We've tried brazing them. And they all look, you know, really sharp, really beautiful. And we're like, ah, we found it. We finally fixed the problem. And then we go to put the cap back on. And, the and it splits and again. tighten it down and snap. Snaps right back again. And it's just, it's just not a good way. Yeah. So, that's a really popular question, and perhaps one day, you know, if I have a, if I get a metal lathe in our new workshop soon, maybe we'll start making some replacement handles or something. But at this point, there's just really no good way to uh, to fix those, those yeah. style of uh, razor handles. Yeah, there's no there's no guarantee because I mean another one of uh, the razors that you worked on for me personally was uh, it was sometime it has to be just based on. Um, you know, just some of the dynamics of the razor itself. It, it probably fell between somewhere between 1929 to 1932. It was a Gillette new. And um, I sent it to you and it was uh, probably uh, green, brown, brass and something else. And it came back 24 karat gold. You know, it was it was beautiful when it came back and it had exactly what you're describing. That You know, it had a crack down by the ball end and it had a crack up by... Uh, by the actual base plate, you know, at the top of, you know, of the tubing itself. And when I got it back, um, you know, obviously the crack was still there, but I could tell you this, after it was plated, it wasn't as painful looking. It was, the yeah. crack was still there, but it was, it was, you know, I mean, obviously no guarantees, but in my situation, it actually, it, it was, it was still noticeable, but it looked a lot nicer with the gold over it. Yeah, and we and, and people ask. That's actually a great uh, kind of segue, Aaron, uh, to another question that I know I get. Maybe someone didn't particularly ask it on the on the Let's Shave Review, but people often ask me, you know, will will the plating cover up? You know, fill in the blank. They'll say, will it cover up a crack? Will it cover up the uh, clicker on the fat boy? Will it will it change the tolerances of this or that? And guys. You know, we put on a, a heavy coating of plating with our with our contracted facility, but it is still uh, we're talking the thickness of maybe a human hair. It's very very small thickness. You know, that's actually going on, and uh, that's very typical. You know, plating's not some thick spray paint or some kind of thick process. It's actually very thin, and it does help to smooth things out between that and our polishing wheels. You know, we can really make that metal look better, and like Aaron said, clean it up. But it's never going to fill in, you know, large gaps or large cracks. It's just not. It doesn't go on like that. Yeah, and I like I said, there's no guarantees. I don't want to make any false pretense that you know. I mean, I I got very lucky, Matt. I think when you did my new, um, that it it came out looking very nice. I mean, I, I could still because I knew where it was. I knew I you know I could see that crack still in both the top and the bottom. But after I got it back and you had replayed it and had it replated, it just didn't look as it didn't jump out at me anymore. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna get a blend. It's kind of like a car. It, you know, exactly. If you, have a, if you get in a car accident and someone does some body work, you know, a lot of times it it, it it can kind of make it look better. But you know, if you really know what you're looking for, you can you can kind of still see some of that. But it definitely exactly. helps to enhance. And, and you know another thing I got to bring up, and it, it's really has nothing to do with what we're talking about. By bringing up in my shave of the day all the time with this specific razor, that twenty nine to thirty two era new um, Gillette, is I swear I am not kidding. That razor, when I tried to shave with it, I hated it before I had it revamped. I mean, I literally hated it. I almost didn't want to send it to you, to be quite honest. I didn't want to spend a dime on the thing. I didn't like it so much. But I said, you know what? Let me make this thing look good. Let me, let me, you know, for collectability's sake, may, let, let me send it to you. Ever since you revamped it, I swear to you, it has probably become one of my top five favorite razors to use. I don't know why, but something magical happened during that revamp that just made me love using that razor. I'm so glad that you find it 
uh, smooth and enjoyable to use. Um, you know, when Gillette was making these, these handles, guys, they were not making some collectible or some uh, premium shaving experience. You know, don't forget that Gillette was in business to sell blades. blades. They were in business to sell blades in 1904, in 1974, <laughs> 1994, 2013. They've always been in the market to sell blades. They've always had what's called a loss leader business method around the handles. When they stamped these handles out, they literally were done in a process called hot or, or you know, hot stamping where the, the brass was heated up a little bit and a, and a large stamp would come down a plate onto another plate and the brass was in between and it would hammer out that guard or that door, you know, and that was about it. There was some light finishing done, very light, but they were making these things by the millions and they were not doing high polish to the metal. When we do our service of the revamp, we do high polish the metal, uh, you know, all the way up to a luster finish. Uh, we use the top quality or top of, of, of our polishing compound to the green uh, chromium oxide uh, uh, polishing rouge. It gets it perfectly mirror finished brass. Okay, so when that gets plated, that, that plating also is at now a high luster finish. And when it comes against your skin, it's going to feel smoother than any Gillette because Gillette, again, did not ever put that level of polishing onto most of their razors. Some of the high-end ones they did, you know, some of the presidents and, you know. Diplomats, the, the probably, razors, yeah. They did a lot of extra work, too, but the average razor, like the new, like Aaron said, that was just make them by the millions and sell them. Exactly, the good old brownie. Um, but you, you know, I, it's like, like I said, it was like magic when I got it back, I saw it and even my wife even commented and she couldn't believe it was the same razor. And then that was the first razor actually, I think I ever shaved with, I got back as a revamp from you. And I just, I, I was blown away. I was stunned. I was like, I couldn't believe this was the same razor that I couldn't stand six weeks earlier. I said, how could it even be possible that this razor is this good now? You know, and it, it's literally in probably my top, top of my rotation. I use it all the time to my, I feel bad. My shave of the days look so boring because you see that new all the friggin' time. It's like, you know, like use something else, buddy. You know, come on. You, you tell you tell us you have over a hundred razors. Use something well, we else. Lot, we get a lot of people who get their razor back and they've used it for longer than just a few years, you know, a few months. They've used it. I've done people's razors, but they bought it original in 1960, and I'm talking to a you know, gentleman who's had it since then, and then when he gets it back, he can't believe it. I've used this razor every day, and now it feels different, and you know, they're always you know, appreciative, they like it, but they're always amazed because, yeah, just something as simple as bringing the metal to a high luster finish before it gets plated makes all the difference. And truth be told, Aaron, to your point, it's funny you like the 1930s so much, the 1930 new. That's actually a very, very similar head that both Feather and Icon have based some of their models off of. That is a, is a model that I think Gillette... It's funny you say really that. Hitting, yeah, they were really hitting their stride when they made that. For comfort, I think the geometry, the angle, whatever it was, the exposure, things were just right on track with that with that head uh, i agree you know the 2010 icons actually are, are almost the head is almost a spitting image of the new the 2010 icons that's what it are almost about. exactly it's like it, it's almost like greg you know you know and i think there's been a lot of articles where even uh greg has said hey i'm not looking to reinvent the wheel it works oh, no, you know greg, 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 like i said we were the first vendor to really bring him into the u.s and now we're carrying his stuff again um and, yeah, he's told me the same thing, you know, and he's actually bounced a lot of things off of us uh, because of, you know, um, you know, me being a collector. I've sent him, I've sent him a few rare pieces. I remember sending him a really cool uh, German double-headed razor from, I think, about the 60s. And, it's, and right when I sent that to him, he came out actually with this double-header razor. And I don't say I'm responsible for that. I think he may have had an idea before that, but I sent him an example of, of one of these uh, that had already existed back in the 60s. So he does do a great job of looking to the past to get inspiration for, for the future. With his line. And I really like what Greg's doing. Yeah, so do I. I, I just, you know, I really think that he... 
you know, I have nothing against Feather. I've honestly never used any of the Feathers. Um, you know, honestly, they're just a little bit too far out of my price range to spend on a new Razor. On a Vintage, I'd be willing to spend, you know, 240 220 whatever they are. But, um, you know, Greg's Razors, you know, where they fall into the 140 150 160 range. You know, that's kind of my max I spend on a new Razor. But for Vintages, I sp I I'm willing to to par with a little bit more but uh the icons I, I just i was really blown away by the uh icon open comb the 2010 which um you know was a little bit hit or miss luckily i got a very good one that shaved wonderfully and i actually added a modular oss uh head to it which added a whole nother dimension to that razor but um Moving forward, just because we're actually coming up on an hour on this video right now, um, I figured maybe uh, we could do one more question and then we'll uh, we'll hit the raffle and see who wins uh, the uh, the starter kit this week. Okay, that sounds great. I'll, I'll I'll probably just answer this one more. It actually just came in about an hour ago. So Michael Young, you got it right under the wire here. I'll, I'll also do a uh, a verbal response on Facebook, but I'll I'll answer this right now. You asked if it's not too late. Um, I'd like to ask if there are any suggestions on gold tone razors for restoration. Can they be stripped down and replated? Um, yeah, that's, that's actually an interesting question. Gold razors do pose to us the most amount of work to do. The reason being, most of the older Gillette gold razors were uh, plated with a very thin 14 karat gold plating and a, and a very thin lacquer was put over that. And the thing that actually gives us the most trouble is that darn lacquer. And we actually have to do a separate process to all the gold razors that involves uh, ammonia to actually help break that, that chemical bond between the lacquer and the metal to get that off first before we do all the polishing. And then we, truth be told, we do it again after the polishing to make sure that no remnants of the lacquer remain because if you have lacquer, it's there to protect the plating that was laid down originally, but also it won't allow any new plating to, to go on. So yeah. if we have any of that old lacquer in between little tiny bits of knurling, on like let's say an aristocrat handle, little tiny cross patching knurling, it won't plate there. So we have to make sure all that lacquer gets off, but we do it all the time and we've really mastered that technique. And uh, so we can restore any razor, whether it's gold or nickel, you know, we can make it gold again if that's what you want. And that's a, we, you know, that's a great process. We, we do the 24 karat gold and now we're also offering rose gold. I know that, um, who was it? Uh, Jeff, Jeff Conrad, Conrad. Yep. was asking about rose gold and I posted a picture up of, of that new rose gold. And that's just with a little bit of copper mixed into the, to the um, plating bath and that gives that nice rose gold look and it, it probably makes it a little bit stronger too the plating i imagine if you mix you know like i said being a, a union metal worker originally in my younger years adding the copper not that copper is an ultra hard metal but um gold is definitely softer than copper so it Actually, probably adds it, a it does that little uh dur durability you're absolutely right and not to try to throw another segue but just briefly people ask do we put a clear coat on our gold? The answer is no. Uh, clear coating, I have never really done a successful clear coating without it looking a little bit off. And the reason is, you know, Gillette did all these pieces, the individual doors, the individual guards, everything was disassembled when they plated and clear coated. And so to get an even finish on all that was very easy compared to doing it when it's all assembled. And not every razor can be disassembled or it needs to be dis disassembled uh, without permanent damage most likely ensuing. And so uh, to try to put a clear coat is just really not needed. What we usually do instead is we just really pile the gold on. We do gold at 40 millionths of an inch. And that's a lot thicker than what Gillette did. That's a lot thicker than any other guys out there doing plating. So uh, it's a hefty layer of gold and it should last for years and years. Absolutely. And I can tell you, you know, Matt, most of the razors that you've done for me have been in gold. And uh, I wish I, you know, I, I actually have an order I'm going to be sending into you pretty, pretty soon. And uh, rose gold, I think, is going to be 
at least one or two of my uh, razors I'm going to have done in rose gold just because I, I just think it's such a unique uh, offering that, you know, it, it just looks so nice. And I, I love the picture you put up for Jeff side by side, the, you know, regular gold plating compared to the rose gold. And um, l last question I'm going to ask, and it's just a yes or no question. Um, let's say um, I had sent in, let's say it's a three-piece razor. Would you be able to do like the head in gold and the handle in rose gold? Would you be able to do like like special orders like that to do like the head in regular and the handle in rose or vice versa? Absolutely. Um, we do that all the time. People ask for all sorts of custom things that aren't even advertised and we... That's why I don't advertise them because I know I'm already going to get asked. So okay. uh, I usually accommodate any kind of custom things. I have guys who want their the red tip on their red tip heavy super speed to be painted black. I got guys who want the numbers on their fat boy to be painted red. I got, you know, we do, we have a assortment of colors and different things we can do. And, you know, the plating, we can mix and match, you know, uh, pieces from the same you know, razor together. That's absolutely fine. And I, I actually kind of love seeing that. It's, it's an interesting take because when you really think about it, any work we do to a vintage razor is already going to take it away from being stock. So once you've accepted that, that it's not stock anymore, just have fun with it. Make it your own. Make it something that's now your piece that you'll hand down, that you'll enjoy, that you can talk about. And it's, now it's your razor. Exactly. Exactly. So on that note, let's find out who... They, and now, correct my pronunciation if I'm pronoun pronouncing it wrong. Parasso? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I have to give Aaron a little bit of some slack. I know he's a, he has a, another, you know, he had a new baby uh, come into the house, yes. which I, I'm very uh, uh, excited to hear about that. Just eight eight, eight great days ago. He expands, and uh, I think he's real busy there, and he's trying to call it. Uh, Prorass, uh, what, what were you calling it? Uh, Prasaro. No, Prasaro. Pr 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 yeah, and, and that's what it was. Yeah, and, and it's... I let it go for a while, but yes, Prasaro. It's another funny point to make out, and I read this on a thread on a forum, that on the, on the East Coast, we call it Prasaro, and on the West Coast, you guys call it Prasaro. You say it. Parasso. It, it's actually in a forum I actually read that we actually call it two different, that are pronounced it two different ways on the East Coast and West Coast. But either which way, guys in the Wet Shaver Review, no matter what, this is this is a staple in the wet shaving world. It's I cut my teeth on it. 90% I'd say of probably wet shavers probably cut their teeth using this product. Um, it is a great, great great formulation um obviously it's been probably the new formulation it was reformulated i think uh, about what what was it about a year ago two years ago uh, yeah, about a year about a year ago it was reformulated but i could tell you right now it works wonderfully um and uh the raffle is for a um a tube of the uh shaving cream for the pre-post shave instead of something similar to like the pre-post shave oil but this is more like a, a cream that you work into your face kind of like a think of like um, um a noxema is i guess a good way to uh think of it and also um and the aftershave splash and that's all on the mentholated green if i'm not mistaken correct yes sir yeah and this is this is uh, and darren did a great introduction on the parasso uh He's right, it's a staple of Italy. They've had it since the 30s. It's been formulated many times, new packaging, and it's still a classic. And I remember, just to date myself here a little bit, I remember buying my very first tube of Parasso at Target when it was carried nationwide in a very small section of Target that most people don't probably even knew was there it was in the beauty section. And that's what was one of my first staple products that, that I fell in love with with wet shaving. And then I, I knew when I became a retailer that I had to carry it, so I, I signed up to become a vendor, and, and we still carry it to this day. That's awesome. So, okay, on that note, guys, um, just because I have the room dark, because we've been looking at this picture of uh, of Matt and the Razor Emporium logo for, a, it's been an hour, I can't believe it's been an hour, I've had a really great time talking to you, and I thank you so much for your time, Matt, And um, but I'm going to actually set the phone down right now. And um, I am going to pick up the camcorder, and I am going to, and you could amazingly, you could actually see it, my uh, trusty cigar box. You could see I have all the entries in there. I'm just going to actually swirl them around. I'm not going to shake the box up or around, but I am going to, you could see my hand in there, mixing them all up. 
And I'm just going to pull my hand out, randomly reach in, grab one, and I'm going to open it up to see who won. And our winner of the week, and I'm going to have to hold this up to the light a little bit, of course my uh, computer decides to die out, is actually Chris Williams. Chris Williams, you have won week number one of the Razor Emporiums um, raffle giveaway. Um, Chris, if you could please uh, forward either myself or Matt directly all your information, and uh, we'll get it right off to you. Um, so, Chris Williams, congratulations. I'm sure you'll absolutely love it if you haven't used it already. Um, it's one of those things, like I said, that, you know, 99% of us have probably cut our teeth on. So it's, uh, and even if you're an experienced wet shaver, I don't think anyone's going to uh, say no to it because it's just such a great performing product. It's just over all these years, it's really just obviously stuck around for so long for a reason. So yep. all that being said, Matt, thank you so much for your time. Be sure to give, uh, you know, my best to, uh, to your wife, Tiffany, to Marissa, to everyone in your staff. Um, and we'll be talking more over again over the next three weeks. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm glad you guys could all tune in tonight. I'm glad uh, Aaron can make this possible. And I'm just so honored to be the, uh, the vendor this month. And I, uh, I, I tell you to please bring the questions on. Keep on asking away. I'm here to help the community. And I, I'm here to turn over a new leaf and help build you know, this new venture. I'm calling the New Razor Emporium. And uh, congratulations to our winner tonight. I, I'll get that in the mail probably actually tomorrow if I get the address. And, uh, yep, thanks so much. I'm just so happy to be here. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. All okay. right. Good night. Bye-bye.